Chapter 16 A few hours later, Theodore and Nicole said their goodbyes to her family, promising to be back soon. In the backseat of the car, they relaxed, and Nicole laughed. Did you see their faces when they realized I brought the prince to lunch at their home? Theodore grinned. It was a fun surprise. I don't know if they found it as much fun as we did, but I thought it was terribly amusing. Nicole shook her head. I hate that the day is already over, she said. But it's not. Now we have dinner with my family. At the palace? She'd been to the palace, certainly, but she had never been there for a formal meal with his family. It sounded nerve-wracking to her. That is where my family lives. Later, in the parlor, with its vaulted ceilings and ancestral portraits, Nicole felt welcomed by the paintings on the walls. Prince Theodore's hand found Nicole's an unspoken reassurance amidst the opulence that was part of his family home. King Albert sat in a high-backed chair, his silver hair catching the soft light, while Queen Beatrice perched beside him, pearls at her throat mirroring the twinkle in her eyes. The queen seemed absolutely thrilled to have Nicole there. Ah, the prodigal son returns, King Albert said. His eyes, however, danced with mirth. I told you I was hoping we would return in time to have supper with the family, Theodore replied, easing Nicole further into the room. Princess Eloise leaned forward where she lounged on an elegant settee, her gaze bright with curiosity. We've been eager to hear about your adventures among the common folk, she teased gently. Adventures indeed, Nicole said, mustering her courage. My family wasn't quite certain what to think when I showed up with the Prince of the Land as my escort. My brothers all enjoyed having him as someone to tease. I think they'd prepared for it. They were in rare form. Amanda, seated gracefully beside Prince James, smiled knowingly. Sounds like it was a lot of fun. I would have felt right at home. I'm glad the day was such a success, Prince James added, gesturing toward the grand doorway leading to the dining room. But for now, let us dine. I believe the chefs have outdone themselves this evening. As they filed into the formal dining room, Nicole's senses were assaulted by the scent of roasted meats and exotic spices. The table, long and ornate, was set with gleaming silver and fine china that looked far too delicate to touch. Servants flitted about like silent specters, attending to every detail. Please, sit, Queen Beatrice invited, a warm smile, directed at Nicole. Thank you, Your Majesty, Nicole murmured, feeling slightly overwhelmed. It was odd how the man beside her had been raised in such finery, but was still humble. It was so far different from her own family's meal that it seemed to be in a different realm entirely. Nicole, King Albert began, once they were all seated, I trust our traditions are not too daunting. You are among friends here, even if the setting might suggest otherwise. Your Highness, it's certainly different from what I'm accustomed to, Nicole admitted, offering a smile to convey her appreciation. But it's a difference I am willing to embrace. It is wonderful to have new people to share our meal with. You and Amanda have made our sons better versions of themselves, King Albert said, raising his glass in a subtle toast, before taking a sip. Let us hope that change continues to bring us closer together, Theodore added. As nervous as she was about eating with his family, he was glad she didn't know what he planned for after the meal. As the first course arrived, conversation flowed around Nicole like a river sometimes inclusive, other times leaving her on the outskirts as topics turned to matters of state and protocol. Yet, she felt a certain rightness in being there. Tell me, Nicole, Princess Eloise asked, drawing her back into the fold. How are your family's Theron Day traditions different from our own? Nicole paused, considering her words carefully. For my family, it tends to be all about the meal. We had turkey, mashed potatoes, cranberry sauce, and so many other things. Truly, it's my favorite meal of the entire year. She glanced at Eloise. What did we miss here? Eloise sighed. 
Oh, we all went out on the balcony of the palace and waved as the parade wound its way past, just as we do every year. Normally I don't mind but this year something felt a bit off. Maybe I'm jealous that my brothers both seem to have found love, and I'm lagging behind. You'll find love soon enough, Amanda said softly, her hand resting upon her small baby bump, a gesture not lost on Nicole. Nicole glanced at Amanda. How are you feeling, Amanda? Is everything all right with the baby now? Amanda's eyes softened, a tender smile curving her lips as she nodded. Yes, thank goodness. The doctor has given us the all clear. It was a frightening time, but we are out of danger now. She patted her belly, where the heir to Theron's throne lay nestled. Little one is quite the fighter. Love and family, King Albert said, nodding sagely. That is the true heart of any tradition. As the meal progressed, Nicole's initial trepidation melted away under the steady warmth of acceptance. It was clear that the royal family valued loyalty and duty, but also the bonds that held them together. And as she dined on dishes she'd only read about in books, Nicole realized that she was slowly becoming more and more familiar with this family and how they did things. Christopher's machinations, while alarming, have at least been stymied, King Albert said, his voice reverberating with authority as he initiated the evening's more somber conversation. Justice will be served. Treason cannot, and will not, be tolerated. Nicole listened intently, her fork poised midair, as she absorbed the gravity of the situation through the words of the king. Around her, the others nodded in solemn agreement, their expressions a blend of relief and residual concern. Yes, father, Theodore concurred, his tone mirroring the king's unwavering commitment to duty. The full weight of the law must be applied. It is imperative for the stability of Theron and that of our family. Stability and safety, Queen Beatrice added softly, which we must always safeguard, for our people and for our future. She glanced toward Amanda, whose hand once again rested protectively over her belly, a silent yet potent symbol of the legacy they all fought to protect. As the dishes were presented and the conversation ebbed and flowed around her, Nicole's thoughts turned inward. She was surprised at just how similar her family was to the royal family of Theron. They both prized loyalty and love above all things. Nicole, you've been quiet, Princess Eloise observed kindly, drawing her back into the present. What are your thoughts on these matters? Caught off guard, Nicole swallowed her mouthful and sought the right words. It's heartening to see that justice is taken so seriously here. Where I come from, we may not wear crowns, but integrity is important. The Marquis had no integrity. Spoken like a true member of the family, Prince James remarked with a warm smile, raising his glass slightly in her direction. As the meal progressed, and the talk of Christopher's fate turned to discussions of the realm's prosperity, Nicole allowed herself to savor not just the food but the feeling of inclusion. Through it all, Theodore's presence beside her was a constant reassurance, the occasional brush of his hand against hers beneath the table a secret promise of things unsaid. The echoes of silverware and crystal had faded into silence as they ascended the grand staircase, its carpet a deeper red than the blush that lingered on Nicole's cheeks. Yet it was not the opulence that set her heart adrift, but the anticipation of what lay beyond the door Theodore now unlocked. Welcome to my truest kingdom, he said with a mirthful glint in his eyes, pushing open the heavy oak door to reveal the sanctuary beyond. Nicole stepped into the studio, a vaulted space where the walls surrendered themselves to canvases and dreams made visible. Her gaze was drawn immediately to an easel standing proudly by the window, bathed in lunar light, a half-finished portrait gazing back at her. Is that... Nicole began, her heart recognizing the strokes that captured her own visage. One of them, Theodore affirmed, closing the door behind them with a soft click. It was here, amid these brushes and colors, that I first saw you, not in flesh and blood, but through the yearning of my soul made manifest upon the canvas. She approached the painting, her steps tentative as if the floor might give way to the gravity of the moment. 
Theodore watched her, a sentinel of longing, his hands clasped behind his back. I still don't understand how you painted me before we even met. Before I knew your name or the sound of your laughter, he replied. I painted a dream, and then you walked into my life, more vivid than any vision. Nicole turned to face him, her eyes shimmering with unshed tears. She saw now, in the way he regarded her, a depth that transcended duty, a loyalty not to crown or country, but to the truth that pulsed quietly between them. Nicole, Theodore began, his voice steady, despite the tumultuous beat of his heart. In this room, I am not Prince Theodore. I am simply Theodore, a man who desperately needs you in his life. He moved closer, his presence a magnetic pull she found impossible to resist. From the moment our paths crossed, you've enchanted me with your strength, your kindness, your unconquerable spirit, he continued, reaching for her hands and holding them within his own, a gesture both grounding and electrifying. And while I may have duties to fulfill, there is one oath that rises above all others, the vow I wish to make to you. From inside his jacket, he produced a small, velvet box and knelt before her, reverence transforming his features. Nicole, will you grant me the honor, the privilege, will you allow me the joy of calling you my wife? Her breath caught, the world narrowing to the earnest green of his gaze, the weight of history that whispered of the future. In the quiet of the studio, amidst a tapestry of moonlight and shadows, Nicole found her answer, as natural and sure as the beating of her heart. Yes, Theodore, she whispered. Yes. And as he rose to seal their promise, with a kiss, he knew that they would endure. The Artist and the Gallery Owner Chapter 17 Nicole's slender fingers trembled as they wrapped around the steaming cup of Earl Grey tea her gaze frozen on the morning paper, splayed open before her. The bold typeface announcing her impending marriage to Prince Theodore looked almost surreal, the letters a stark contrast against the white expanse of page one. The palace must have released a statement. Nicole, did you see this? Maria, her assistant, fluttered into the gallery with an identical copy of the paper tucked under her arm. Impossible to miss, Nicole responded, the words laced with forced cheer as she set her cup down with a delicate clink. Her heart fluttered at the reality settling over her. The gallery doors chimed their familiar tune as a steady stream of patrons entered, their faces blooming with smiles and eyes seeking out the bride-to-be. She quickly felt swarmed with people as the congratulations started pouring in. Nicole, darling, we are so thrilled for you. Mrs. Haversham, a patron known for her impeccable taste in art and gossip, enveloped her in a perfumed embrace that left no room for escape. To think, our little gallery owner marrying royalty. Thank you, Mrs. Haversham, Nicole managed, her smile practiced, yet genuine. She withdrew slightly, straightening the hem of her chic black dress, a piece chosen for its quiet elegance. Prince Theodore is a lucky man, Mr. Renard said. He was another regular, whose keen eye often spotted the hidden gems of her exhibitions. And what a wedding it will be! All the magazines are already clamoring for details. I see that, Nicole said. She folded her hands together, the diamond on her finger catching the soft light and scattering it across the room. Duty and loyalty, she reminded herself, feeling the weight of those words alongside the weight of the ring. As the well wishes continued, Nicole's gaze swept over the crowd, each face a reminder of the life she had cultivated here. Yet, despite the familiar surroundings, an unfamiliar tightness constricted her chest, longing for Theodore's reassuring presence. Nicole, a gentle voice, called. It was Maria again, her expression soft with understanding. You're handling this with such grace. Your strength is truly an inspiration. Is it strength? Nicole mused aloud. Or is it simply playing the role expected of me? Both, I believe, Maria replied, tucking a loose strand of hair behind Nicole's ear with sisterly affection. And both are equally admirable. Nicole allowed herself to be carried by the tide of enthusiasm, her responses automatic, her smile unwavering. 
Yet beneath the surface, her thoughts churned like a stormy sea, yearning for the tranquility of Theodore's quiet strength. Nothing in the gallery could capture her attention as it once did. She longed for Theodore's quiet gaze, a beacon in the tempest of her current life. Nicole, called an eager patron, I must say, your taste is impeccable. This exhibit is breathtaking. Thank you, she replied. Suddenly she'd lost what she should say to others. She felt overwhelmed by the gallery, by the wedding, and by life. As she spoke, the crowd shifted. Through the temporary corridor, she caught sight of a man, his hands deep in the pockets of a nondescript coat. A jolt of unease shot through her, an instinctive reaction that had become all too familiar, this past week. The gallery, her sanctuary, suddenly seemed less welcoming, its corners shadowed with potential threats. Excuse me, she murmured, her smile never faltering though her eyes betrayed a flicker of fear. Nicole retreated through the crowd, making her way to the back room under the pretense of business needing her immediate attention. Let me know if anyone needs me, she instructed her assistant. Of course, Nicole, Maria replied, taking the reins without question. Once secluded by the door marked, private, Nicole leaned against it, allowing the coolness of the wood to seep into her skin, a stark contrast to the heat flushing her cheeks. Here she allowed herself a moment of vulnerability. Theodore's absence was a chasm in her chest, the distance between them magnified by the echoes of her racing heart. She felt as if she stood on the beach, trying to observe a storm, but it came and washed her out to sea. Every twitch a person made seemed to signal danger to her mind now. She had once relished her time alone, thankful to not have people around her, and now all she could think about was getting back to Theodore. Even when she was in a crowd, she felt unsafe without him there. Hurry back, she whispered to the empty room, her words a prayer, to the silence. I need your strength, to still these tremors in my soul. Theodore, with his steadfast gaze and gentle reassurances, had become more than her partner. He was her confidant, her protector, her grounding force. And without him, the gallery seemed like a dangerous place where every stranger's glance held the weight of unseen dangers. She couldn't ask people not to put their hands in their pockets, yet when they did, she trembled. Nicole straightened. She couldn't give in to the fear that sought to cripple her spirit. But as she steadied her breath and prepared to face the crowd once more, she knew she had to put on a brave face. Her future husband was a busy man who couldn't afford to spend all his time babysitting her. Nicole, came Theodore's voice, and she turned to see him walking toward her, carrying a wicker basket, the scent of fresh bread and herbs wafting from within. His eyes found hers, brimming with concern. Your lunch, he said, setting the basket down, before taking a seat opposite her. I thought you might like something from that little bistro next door. Thank you, Theodore, she murmured, though she wasn't sure she could eat with as nervous as she was. You've been quiet, he observed, watching her with an intensity that seemed to pierce through her defenses. Nicole exhaled. At night, every creak of this old building sets me on edge. I lie awake, straining against the silence, for any sign of danger. Her voice broke on the last word. Theodore's expression tightened, his jaw clenching at the admission. You shouldn't be afraid, he stated. He sat down beside her, putting an arm around her shoulders. I'm haunted by shadows, instead of inspired by light, she confessed, her gaze lowering to her hands that now clasped together in her lap. I know the danger has passed, so why am I still so scared? Then come away with me, back to the palace. His offer was tender, but firm. You are safe here, Nicole, but it's not enough to be safe, you deserve to feel safe. A sigh escaped her, one that seemed to carry the burden of countless sleepless nights. To leave the gallery, she began, torn between her sanctuary of art and the refuge found with him. Is to heal, he finished softly. The gallery will thrive, as it always has. But you, my dearest, need respite. Nicole's heart fluttered with a mixture of anxiety and longing. To abandon her gallery felt like a betrayal, 
Yet the very notion of being enveloped in the protective embrace of the palace walls brought a sense of solace she could no longer deny herself. All right, she whispered. She hated to feel she was giving up, but perhaps she could come back after she'd spent some time feeling safe. Good. Theodore reached across the space between them, his hand enveloping hers. We'll go as soon as you're ready. Until then, I'm here. Nicole spent the next couple of hours getting her employees ready to take on her job for a while. All of them knew what she'd been through, and no one thought less of her, but Nicole thought less of herself. The danger was gone with Christopher in jail, and she shouldn't be so worried all the time. When she felt as if the next few exhibits would be handled well, she gathered her personal belongings and left with Theodore. Nicole, Theodore began as they got into the back of the car he'd called for, a guard and driver in the front, I've been thinking. If being alone makes you so nervous, maybe we should rush the wedding. Then you don't need to worry about being alone so much. Nicole's heart skipped at his words. A quick wedding? The notion was both exhilarating and daunting. She envisioned the intricacies of royal nuptials and felt a flutter of panic at the enormity of such an undertaking. Do you really think we could? Her voice held a note of disbelief, though not displeasure. Definitely. He took her hand in his and held it tightly. My mother, Amanda, and Eloise will help you. They're all ecstatic that we've found one another, and they want to do all they can to help. The idea of becoming his wife in mere weeks wrapped around her, like a silken shawl, both comforting and luxurious. Three weeks, she said, the words spilling out with an unexpected rush of clarity. We could do it in three weeks. His gaze snapped to hers, surprise and delight mingling in his deep green eyes. Truly? You believe we can arrange everything in such a short time? Absolutely. A laugh bubbled up from within her. It'll take a whirlwind of planning, but I'm no stranger to orchestrating grand events. And besides, I have Amanda, Queen Beatrice, and Princess Eloise. Together, we're a formidable force. Then it's settled. Theodore hugged her to his side. In three weeks, you shall become my wife, and no shadow will dare touch you again. Three weeks, Nicole repeated softly. With a resolve fortified by love and loyalty, she decided then and there to meet with Amanda and the royal family at the earliest opportunity. As Theodore's thumb traced gentle circles over the back of her hand, Nicole allowed herself to imagine the day they would stand before their world, speaking their vows. The gallery's walls faded into the background of her mind. In their place rose the image of an altar, the echo of vows, and the bright future that awaited them both, free from fear. Theodore's brow furrowed as he watched Nicole, her fingers trembling slightly. He knew that beneath her composed exterior, her thoughts were churning like a tempestuous sea. Her laughter had grown rarer, her smiles more measured since the kidnapping. Nicole, he said, I've been wrestling with something since, since that day. She looked up from her hands, her eyes meeting his. Theodore? Every joy I wish to bring into your life seems shadowed by dangers I never intended for you, he said. I hate that I brought danger into your life. You can't blame yourself for the actions of others, she replied, though her voice faltered just enough to betray her lingering fear. Ah, but I do, Theodore admitted. Because it is my world that has made you feel this way. Nicole took a deep breath. It's your world I am choosing regardless of the storms it brings. He wanted to make things right, to offer her a haven free from threats and shadows. Maybe there's no perfect solution, Nicole continued. If there is, I'll find it, Theodore vowed. Yet deep inside, he questioned whether his promise could shield her from her fears. I want to mend what's been broken, he confessed. Chapter 18 Nicole stood in front of a mirror, her wedding gown cascading down in layers of ivory silk and lace, the fabric hugging her form before flaring into a train that whispered a fairy tale. Eloise fussed over the placement of every pearl button along the back, her hand steady, despite the underlying current of excitement. 
Nicole, you look absolutely stunning, Amanda breathed out, her eyes shining with unshed tears of joy. Eloise nodded in quiet agreement, the picture of poise, yet unable to mask the gleam of pride in her gaze for her friend. Thank you, Nicole replied, her voice laced with gratitude and a subtle tremor of nerves. Rushed or not, this wedding is going to be perfect, Eloise chimed in. Don't mind the gossip mongers. They'd find something to talk about even if you'd planned the wedding, for an eternity. Nicole's lips curled into a wistful smile. I know, she admitted. I can't let whispers cloud today, the day I become Theodore's wife. Amanda and Eloise exchanged a look, a silent communication that spoke volumes of their shared history and understanding. Perfect, Eloise added, stepping forward to adjust the delicate tiara nestled in Nicole's hair. And besides, who cares what they say? This isn't about them. It's about you and Theodore. Nicole gazed at her friends, her allies in this whirlwind that was now her life. You're right. As always, she conceded with a soft chuckle. Her heart swelled with gratitude for their unwavering support. Then it settled. Amanda clasped Nicole's hands within her own. No worrying about anything. Today, we celebrate your love and the beginning of a new chapter. Let's not keep your prince waiting any longer, Eloise suggested. Nicole nodded. She was ready. Ready to step into the role fate had laid out before her, to embrace the duties and loyalties that came with it. Today, she whispered to herself, I marry for love. And with that, Nicole stepped out of the room, her train trailing behind her. Nicole's heart throbbed in her chest, a rhythm syncopated by the soft murmur of voices and the rustle of satin. The grandeur of the room did little to quell the fluttering of nerves in her stomach. The door creaked open, and Nicole's mother swept into the chamber. Her dress, though elegant, was a simple design of navy chiffon, and her hair framed her face in gentle waves. Nicole, her mother greeted. Mum. Nicole replied. She moved toward her mother, arms outstretched, seeking the comfort found in the embrace they shared. Look at you, her mother murmured, stepping back to appraise Nicole with eyes that glistened with unshed tears. You look every inch a princess. Only on the outside, Nicole confided. Her gaze drifted over the ornate furnishings, the delicately carved mahogany, the plush velvet drapes. I'll never understand how you'll manage to live, surrounded by all this, wealth. Her mother's tone was one of bemusement. Nicole allowed herself a small smile. It's not the things, Mom. It's the people, Theodore, Amanda, Eloise, that anchor me. They remind me who I am, where I come from. Still, her mother replied. All this pageantry, it's overwhelming. Are you sure? Aren't you the one who had me believing I should marry Prince Theodore, before I even started school? Nicole reached out, her hand finding her mother's. I'm marrying Theodore, because I love him, not for any other reason. I'd be more inclined to not marry him over the title and wealth. Her mother's smile bloomed then. Love is all you need, my dear. Just remember that when you sit down at a table more expensive than the house you grew up in. Ah, but will it be filled with as much laughter and life? Nicole mused aloud. She considered the countless meals shared at their humble kitchen table, the echo of joyous conversation, and the clink of glasses raised in celebration. Nothing could ever replace those memories, Nicole continued. Not even a palace. Good girl, her mother said. A soft rapping on the door heralded the approach of regality itself. Enter, Nicole's mother called. The door swung open, and Queen Beatrice glided into the room, the very picture of stately grace. Nicole's mother rose to her feet, seeming more than a little nervous. Your Majesty, she said curtsying. Please, no need for such formality among family, Queen Beatrice responded. She extended her hand, not as a monarch to a subject, but as one mother to another. Beatrice will do just fine, the queen added. Thank you, 
B. Your Majesty. Beatrice. The words stumbled off her tongue. Nicole observed the interaction, the fluttering in her chest easing slightly as the queen enveloped her mother in a brief but sincere embrace. Her mother's shoulders relaxed, and Nicole felt a kindred spirit in both women, each strong in her own right. Today, we welcome you to our family, Queen Beatrice said. Thank you, Nicole murmured. Shall we? George's voice was a grounding presence, his hand extended toward Nicole. She placed her palm in her father's, feeling the calluses of years of work, a comforting contrast to the smoothness of her satin gloves. The procession to the chapel was a slow unfurling of tradition and anticipation. Nicole's steps were measured, her father's arm a pillar of strength as they traversed the long aisle together. Above them, stained glass windows splashed colors onto the stone floor, a kaleidoscope of hues dancing with each step they took. Remember to breathe, George whispered, his breath stirring strands of hair that had escaped her elaborate updo. Nicole inhaled deeply. The pew stretched endlessly on either side. She focused on the rhythm of her father's steady heartbeat, a silent drumbeat guiding her forward. Feels like walking in a dream, doesn't it? George asked. More like stepping into a fairy tale, Nicole replied. Either way, you're the princess, he said, pride resonating in his voice, a subtle tremor betraying his emotion. The murmur of the congregation rolled like distant thunder as Nicole stood at the altar. Nicole Elizabeth Winters, the minister's voice boomed, Do you take Prince Theodore to be your lawfully wedded husband? Her heartbeat quickened, but somewhere, Nicole found her voice. I do. Then by the power vested in me, the minister continued, I now pronounce you husband and wife. As the final syllables resonated through the sacred space, a collective breath was released, and the nation exhaled alongside its new princess. They arrived at the palace, where servants hustled to prepare the wedding supper. The scent of roasted meats and exotic spices wafted from the kitchen, promising a feast fit for royalty. Everyone's been working around the clock, Theodore murmured to her, squeezing her hand. For us. For us, Nicole echoed. After supper, he escorted her to the lavishly decorated ballroom. May I have this dance? Theodore asked, offering his arm with a bow that was equal parts playful and courtly. Of course, my prince, Nicole said, accepting his invitation. Nicole allowed herself to be swept away by the rhythm, her earlier fears dissolving. Later, in the room they would share, they stood together, looking out the window at the fireworks that had been set off in celebration of their wedding. Nicole, Theodore whispered. When she turned toward him, he held out an envelope, embossed with their intertwined monogram. I planned a honeymoon for us. I thought we'd go to a private island. Nicole's first thought was it sounded like a dream. Yet there was something unpalatable about it. I. I don't think I can leave right now, Nicole confessed. Her heart longed for adventure, but another part clung to the safety of the palace. Hey, Theodore said. This is your home now. We'll only go if you want. She leaned into his touch, the warmth of his skin grounding her. Let's have our adventure here. Here, he agreed, smiling. Our first journey will be discovering each other. Theodore's hands traced the curve of Nicole's spine. His touch ignited a fire within her. Their bodies entwined. The room was filled with the intoxicating symphony of their breaths mingling, hearts beating in time. The world seemed to stand still as they surrendered to the rhythm of their desires. Nicole felt Theodore's love wrap around her, offering solace and strength. Every caress whispered promises of a future where they would conquer the world together. They didn't need faraway places to be happy. They had their own kingdom right at their fingertips. Chapter 19 Theodore and Nicole painted together in their private studio. A silver platter bearing the remnants of a breakfast feast for two rested on the antique table between them, an intimate setting within the grandeur of the palace. 
your technique has improved tremendously, Theodore remarked, his voice laced with genuine admiration as he gazed at the canvas propped against an easel. Nicole's cheeks flushed with a warm glow. I could say the same for you, she replied, her eyes flitting toward his canvas, where a stormy seascape spoke of passion and tempestuous nature. You capture emotion with every stroke. Ah, but it is your work that captures the soul, he countered, moving to stand beside her. His hand found its way to the small of her back, a gesture that grounded her. Drawing a deep breath, Nicole allowed herself to lean into his touch. The past two weeks had been a dream of love and creativity. Yet, outside the sanctuary of Theodore's room, reality loomed, a world that demanded she step forward as his partner, not just in marriage, but in royal duty. Nicole, Theodore began, it's time we venture beyond these walls. The people are eager to see their new princess. Her heart constricted at the thought, fear creeping through her. I know, she whispered. But the mere thought leaves me paralyzed. I can't seem to do this alone, Theodore. You will never be alone, he assured her. I shall be right there, at your side. And if I can't be then Eloise or Amanda will. I need you, Nicole confessed. More than you could possibly imagine. Then you shall have me, he vowed, the sincerity in his eyes unwavering. At every turn, with every step, until your confidence outshines even the brightest star in our sky. Promise? The word hung between them, fragile and laden with hope. Upon my honor, he pledged, sealing his bow with a kiss upon her forehead. With you by my side, perhaps I can learn to face the crowds without dread. Maybe she wouldn't hear danger in every sound eventually. You will, Theodore agreed. And should fear ever find you, look to me, and remember I won't let anything happen. Asterisk. Nicole, Theodore began, his voice cutting through the silence with practiced concern. I have noticed the shadows that linger in your eyes, even as you smile. Are you all right? She clutched at the fabric of her dress, a once comforting habit, now a telltale sign of her inner turmoil. I keep trying, Theodore. But the fear is like a relentless tide, washing away my resolve. A gentle nod from Theodore ushered in Dr. Langley, a man who had a reputation for calming anxious minds. His demeanor was calm, his eyes kind. Your Highness, he greeted with a respectful bow to Theodore, before turning his attention to Nicole. It is my understanding you're facing some challenges. I am here to help you navigate through them. Nicole's fingers stilled, the warmth in Dr. Langley's gaze offering a glimmer of hope. As they conversed, his words were not probing but guiding, leading her through the labyrinth of her fears with a steady hand. Imagine your anxiety as a color, Dr. Langley suggested. What would it be? Gray, she murmured after a moment. A stormy gray, swirling and unpredictable. Then let us introduce new colors to your palette, shades of courage and serenity. Together, we will blend them until the gray is but a distant memory. In the days following, Nicole found solace in the company of Eloise and Amanda. The library became their haven. Have you read this one? Amanda asked, sliding an elegantly embossed novel across the table. It tells a tale of a woman much like yourself, overcoming the odds. Indeed, Eloise chimed in. There is strength in these pages, lessons intertwined with each character's journey. Together, they delved into stories of heroines who conquered empires and hearts alike, their laughter echoing. In fiction, Nicole discovered pieces of her courage that needed to be put together again. Sometimes, Nicole confided during a pause filled with the rustling of pages, I feel as though I'm a character in one of these novels, waiting for the author to grant me bravery. Eloise looked at her with empathy, but you see, Nicole, you're the author of your own story. And each day, you must write a little more of your strength into being. Let us be the supporting cast, Amanda added, her voice light yet firm. We'll help you get rid of all those fears. Nicole took in their encouraging faces. It was amazing to her how much they'd helped her through her fears. 
Thank you, she said. You make me believe I can face tomorrow's page with a bit more courage. Tomorrow and every day after, Eloise replied. Asterisk. In the grand dining hall of the palace, Nicole sat, her posture perfect, her hands folded neatly in her lap, yet she felt anything but serene. Her gaze flicked across the faces of the nobility, their laughter and chatter did little to suit the storm within her. Sometimes, the supper parties were simply the hardest things to get through. Your Highness, might I say you look as radiant as the moonlight on our Alanian shores? Prince Bernard's voice pulled her attention toward him. He was speaking to Eloise, his eyes locked onto hers. Prince Bernard, you flatter me, Eloise replied, her cheeks flushed with a blend of amusement and embarrassment. But I thank you for such kind words. Nicole observed the exchange from a distance. She admired her friend's ease in these social waters. She felt as if she was going to drown in the same waters. When the time came for the men to retire to a separate room, Theodore rose, offering Nicole a reassuring smile. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, Prince James announced. Duty calls us away, but please, continue to enjoy the hospitality of the palace. When the door closed behind the king and his entourage of princes, Nicole felt the walls of the dining hall close in around her, and she excused herself, claiming a need for fresh air. Her escape led her not to the palace gardens, but upward. Nicole's footsteps echoed off the marble floors until she reached the sanctuary of Theodore's studio. It would be some time before she could possibly feel at ease in the gardens. Nicole moved to the easel that held a blank canvas. She donned the smock that had become her second skin, its fabric stained with the battles of her artistic endeavors. She knew she should really change out of her evening gown, but the call of the canvas was too strong. She picked up a palette, already dotted with dried remnants of color, and began mixing anew. With each stroke against the canvas, Nicole sought to release the tension that had built up over the evening. As she painted, and thought about how well the others managed the formal conversations, a whisper of self-doubt began to grow. Confront it, she told herself, the mantra of her recent conversations with the psychologist echoing in her mind. Face the canvas as you would face them. But for all her resolve, Nicole knew that the real confrontation lay not with the blank canvas before her, nor with the people below, but with the shadows of fear that lingered. Nicole's hand trembled as the brush touched the canvas, a quivering culprit betraying her inner turmoil. She dipped the bristles into a hue of midnight blue, attempting to capture the serenity of the night sky, but the stars she painted were blurred smudges, their light dimmed by her frustration. Compose yourself, she whispered, the brush strokes growing more frantic, you are a princess now. The vast emptiness of the canvas mirrored the hollow feeling in her chest. With each attempt to add depth, to breathe life into her art, it seemed to recede further from her grasp. Where is the passion you once held at your fingertips, she chastised herself, watching as the colors muddled into an indistinct mess on the palette. Her thoughts swirled like the paints before her. She dabbed at the canvas, trying to correct a clumsy stroke, but it only served to distort the image further. Damn it, she murmured, her voice rising in pitch, a crescendo of despair. Why can't I make it right? The door creaked open, and Theodore stepped in. His silhouette, framed by the doorway, was both a beacon of comfort and a reminder of the expectations upon her. Nicole, he called softly, the concern evident in his tone. She didn't turn to face him. Instead, Nicole stared at the abomination that was her painting, a testament to her unraveling composure. Everything is fine, she lied, a single tear streaking down her face. Nicole, Theodore's voice was closer now imbued with tenderness and worry as he approached her. He set his hand gently on her shoulder, an anchor in the storm of her emotions. Look at it, Theo, she gestured hopelessly toward the canvas. I've lost it. I can't even paint anymore. Shoo, he turned her to face him, his thumb catching a tear as it fell. This isn't about the painting, is it? Talk to me. 
She clutched the paintbrush like a lifeline, the tool that had once been a source of pride, now a symbol of her self-doubt. I'm afraid, she confessed. Afraid that I'll never belong here, in your world. That I'll always be, less. Never, Theodore assured her, his gaze steady and full of unwavering conviction. You are everything this kingdom, and I, need. More than you can imagine. As he drew her into his embrace, Nicole allowed herself a moment of surrender. Asterisk. The following morning, Theodore let an idea he'd had run through his mind yet again. He hated the idea, and yet, if it would help Nicole, he was willing to do most anything. He traced the curve of Nicole's jaw, guiding her gaze, to meet his. His eyes held a question that seemed to weigh heavily on his heart. Nicole, he began, do you believe facing Christopher would help you heal? Nicole's breath hitched at the mention of the name that haunted her dreams. Her pulse quickened, and for a moment, she was back in captivity, wondering if she would ever see those she loved again. Perhaps, she said, her voice quivering, it might let me reclaim a part of myself I thought lost. Theodore studied her, his brow furrowed with concern. If it is your wish, he said, I will arrange it. You need not face him alone. Nicole nodded. I'll do it, she affirmed, feeling as if just saying the words made her braver. Then we'll go together, he murmured. Chapter 20 Nicole stood on the terrace of the palace, looking out over the capital city of Theron, enjoying the beauty of the city. Do you feel better? Theodore asked, joining her there. They had gone to the prison that day, and she had faced Christopher, telling him that she wouldn't let him take her peace away from her. I do, Nicole said softly, turning to wrap her arms around her husband. Then it was worth it to see that odious man again. Odious, she repeated. I like that word. He is everything vile and ugly about the world, and I do believe I never want to speak of him again. Theodore smiled. Then we'll never mention him. He stroked her back, proud that she'd faced him without fear. I hope you know, I'll never allow him close enough to hurt you again. Of course, he'll spend the rest of his life rotting in that prison with all the testimony against him. Good. That's where he belongs. She turned to where she was looking out over the city again. I think I want to check in on the gallery tomorrow. I know my people are running it well, but I feel like I can finally go back without the fear strangling me. Then we'll go. But not until we've cut the ribbons for the new wing on the children's hospital at noon. She smiled. I don't think I had any idea just how much of your life was filled with public appearances. Theodore laughed. It's my duty to support my father and brother. How do you feel about the appearance tomorrow? Do you feel comfortable? Nicole shrugged. Honestly, I'm not sure I'll ever feel comfortable with public appearances, but I feel like I can go and smile and shake hands with the best of them. He chuckled. That's all I ask. Asterisk. When they left the hospital the following day, Theodore told their driver to meet them at the gallery. Their guard followed behind them, but if they didn't think about him, they were like any newlywed couple in the city. Market stalls boasted wares from far and wide. Cobblestone pathways gleamed underfoot, leading to plazas, where artists displayed their work. Look there, do you see? The mural on the eastern wall. It tells our story, doesn't it? She laughed. It looks more like a fairy tale to me. I do know the difference between reality and a fairy tale, she said grinning at him. You seem more at ease today. I cannot begin to express how much better I feel after yesterday. I do believe I'm ready to fulfill my obligations to our country now. Theodore smiled, pulling her to him with a one-armed hug. I'm proud of you for even thinking you can. Truly, it feels almost miraculous at the moment. I can't promise I'll never be afraid again, she said softly, but I will always do my best. That's all anyone can ask, he said. At the gallery, everything seemed to be working perfectly. 
She walked through the exhibit, something she'd started working on but hadn't been able to finish. It wasn't all exactly the way she would have put it herself, but it worked together to form a beautiful story of the artist's life. She praised the employee who was out front, and she and Theodore left the gallery. They are doing beautifully, she said. There's no need for me to be there, meddling in it. They got into the back of the sedan waiting for them, and Theodore instructed the driver to take them back to the palace. Are you hungry? He asked. A little. More than anything, I want to put paintbrush to canvas. I have something in my head that just needs to come out. Then we'll order lunch in our studio, and we'll paint. Does it ever bother you that you have to share your studio with me? He chuckled. I share my bed with you. I share my life with you. What does it matter to me to share a studio with you as well? She grinned, resting her head on his shoulder. I love you, Theodore. It was the first time she'd said the words to him, and though she knew he understood how she felt, it was good to finally say them. He kissed the top of her head. I love you too. So much. I knew the moment I saw your face emerge on canvas that I would love the woman behind the painting. Well, it's a good thing you found me, and not my evil twin then. Evil twin? He asked, smiling. Well, she existed in my mind for quite a while. Keep her there. I like the non-evil you. Instead of going up to their studio, they ran up to their room, changed clothes, and called for lunch. I think we should eat out on the balcony, and then spend the rest of the day painting. Well, until we have to go down for supper. The entire royal family of Alenia will be here this evening. She sighed. I will smile and pretend it's exactly where I want to be. You're a good wife, Nicole. He kissed her quickly before calling for their lunch. It was going to be a long, productive day. Epilogue Theodore stood before an easel, his hand moving with gentle precision as he added strokes to a canvas that captured the very essence of harmony. Nicole admired his work from a few paces away. Your talent never ceases to amaze me, Nicole said. Theodore glanced at her. It's a pale reflection of the beauty you brought into my life, he replied. I have some news, she said softly, holding something behind her back. He turned to her, giving her his full attention. And that is? Well, I wanted to make this big production of showing you, but I just can't wait long enough to set it up just right. She pulled a piece of plastic from behind her back. And what is this? He asked, staring down at the thing. This is a positive pregnancy test. She grinned at him. The other twelve positive tests are in our bathroom trash. I had to be sure before I told you. He chuckled. Thirteen tests? Do you think that's enough to give us a modicum of certainty? I sure hope so. If not, I see the doctor tomorrow. Nicole loved the idea of being treated by the same doctor who had delivered him and treated his father for his heart attack. I'm sure Amanda and James will be thrilled to have a cousin for their little blessing. I want to learn the gender of ours, though. I don't care if we announce it to the whole world or just know it for ourselves. Nicole nodded. Yes, I want to know as well. I'm impressed that James and Amanda seem to be able to wait without losing their minds. He laughed, wrapping his arms around her and holding her tightly. I think we should name him Nicholas if he's a boy, and Theodora if it's a girl. Theodora? She asked, wrinkling her nose. I suppose we could call her Dora. Perfect. She'll be our exploration into the art of parenting. That's an art we need to get right. That we do.